not met me. I'm Janice Hall, and I'm the manager of the Business and Institutional Management Office and the lead on the Human System Academy, and I'm excited about seeing all of you all here. Uh, some housekeeping things just before we get started with our taping and everything is, uh, uh, number one, as they say on the airplane, we're here to do pharmacology. If that's not the lecture you're here for, then you need to get on the plane. Okay. So that's what we're doing here today. And uh, we're, we wanted to do the uh, safety activity to let you all know that in the event that the bell goes off, the door right out here, you're going to go out this closest door, which is right out here, and go out of the parking lot right there to the end, right there to the hedge. The bathrooms, men and women, is right outside this door to the left. You'll see a hallway right there that the men's restroom and the uh, women's restroom is over there. And then introducing my staff that works for Human System Academy, Dr. Pam Dinkins, uh, Dietra Nimmons, and my secretary, Ruby Celia Guerra, uh, are the folks that have been contacting you and sending you the letters and uh, keeping up with all of you all as far as who is ready uh, to receive their certificates. As of this coming up Friday <coughs> afternoon, Dr. Davis <coughs> will be issuing nine certificates because we've had nine people who have done all of the course completion that's necessary to get their ROI certificates. And so I'm excited. And I want you all to continue to be interested. And the other thing I need you to do, besides signing in and uh, making sure that you picked up a uh, survey, is I appreciate those of you who have gone into Saturn and given us your input on things that you would like to see, because that also helps us know what kinds of classes that people have interest in and want us to try to schedule. And so, like I said, we want to keep the the academy relevant and uh, something that all of our employees would be interested in. So it's only as good as you all make it. And so I appreciate that and thank you. So Pam? Thank you. Again, good afternoon to you. Thank you. Our speakers today are Dr. Tina Bayouz and also Dr. Virginia Waltering. Uh, I wanted to let you know that Dr. Bayouz graduated from the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Pharmacy with her Doctor of Pharmacy in 2000. Upon graduation, she accepted a position in the pharmacology laboratory as an employee of Wiley, supporting various research projects, including pharmaceutical stability research for the on-orbit medical kits. In addition, she was responsible for the development and maintenance of the medication monographs for the Space Shuttle and International Space Station medical kits. In 2002, Dr. Bayous became the lead pharmacist for the first and only NASA pharmacy that opened its doors in 2003. As the lead, she was responsible for the original startup work for the pharmacy, including the physical layout, policy and procedure development for the medication, management and implementation of the pharmacy practice programs. As clinical, Staff team members, Dr. Bayouz and her pharmacist team work with the JSC Clinic and Medical Operations Group in support of crew member and employee health. Dr. Bayouz serves as the pharmacist consultant to the medical operations and the health maintenance system groups for the on-orbit medical care, including medical kit design, medication selection, and process development. She is responsible for leading the pharmacist team in the provision and packing of the medications for space flight through the JSC Pharmacy, as well as overseeing the medication management of the kids. She is a member of the operations team responsible for pharmacy practice for remote operations, including the facility in Star City, Russia, and the same day landing program known as the Direct Return Program. Dr. Bayouz serves as a liaison between the Space Medicine Clinical and Operational <coughs> Pharmacy Programs and the research community. And as of January 2012, is a part of an integrated team with the pharmacology discipline. Dr. Bayouz has presented numerous topics in pharmacy practice as it relates to space medicine. In May 2012, she was named an honorary NASA flight surgeon 
and in 2013, she was named an Associate Fellow with the Aerospace Medical Association. Next, Dr. Virginia Wartrain. I'm, and, uh, I am handling this now so we can flow smoothly uh, when the presentation starts. Dr. Wartrain is a senior scientist in the Division of Space Life Sciences in the University Space Research Association, and that's commonly known as USRA, and serves as a pharmacology discipline lead at the NASA Johnson Space Center Human Health and Countermeasures, Di Countermeasures Division, where her role is to determine research needs and see that the required progress is being made to ultimately ensure that medications will be both safe and effective in on NASA missions. Her currently funded projects include an analysis of retrospective medications uh, for use on spaceflight missions and design and implementation of a new iOS-based <coughs> app for the iPad collection of medication data. Recently, she completed a number of projects which include uh, a newly awarded study of uh, pharmacokinetics in spaceflight, which will begin soon, and also the examination of the stability of medication stored in the spaceflight environment and gene and protein expression changes associated with, uh, with spaceflight. She collaborates as well extensively with companies, academia, and nonprofits. She also hosts college and high school summer interns at, J at JSC each year and was awarded the 2012 and 2013 Student Career Exploration Program Mentor of the Year Award. She gives guest lectures at local universities and has adjunct appointments at the University of Texas, Medical Branch in Galveston, and also the University of Houston. She received her doctorate in pharmacological and physiological science from St. Louis University after earning a BS in chemistry at Florida State University. She's published a number of uh, studies on ligand-gated ion channels in the brain and the spinal cord. She joined USRA and Space Flight Research in 2009. In 2012, her book, Reviewing Pharmacolog Pharmacology in Space Flight, was published by Springer, and the book is entitled Space Pharmacology, Space Development Series. I present to you now Dr. Tina Holly. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Ginger and I kind of flipped a coin, and it's uh, we're going to do uh, pharmacy practice first and then transition over into research. And I think the slide deck will actually help with that momentum. So, with that, I'm going to launch into my presentation. The objectives of today are going to be to in introduce you all to the JSC Pharmacy here, at, um, here on site, kind of provide a big picture overview of how the pharmacy services fit into the space program, outline the roles and responsibilities of the pharmacist staff, discuss issues with the provision of drug therapy within the space flight environment, uh, considerations of the contents of the ISS med kits will be discussed. Uh, medication kit packing timeline that helps put uh, some things into perspective for folks. And then, of course, throughout the whole talk, there will be examples of unique challenges um, within the space medicine pharmacy practice. So the JSC Pharmacy actually is relatively new. Um, it opened on March 31st, 2003. Uh, we're located in Building 8 right now, but in 2015 we're going to be moving with the clinic over to Building 45. I don't have a date yet, but it's sometime in 2015. There are pharmacists on staff. Uh, we have myself and another full-time, and then I have two part-time per diem folks. Um, the services that uh, enjoy the pharmacy are the clinic and, of course, space medicine operations, and more and more we're getting involved with research, and I'm sure Ginger will be discussing that. The physical building of the pharmacy provides for control and accountability of medications, um, and it provides the necessary security that we need to have as if um, that because it is a pharmacy on site. We abide by all of the federal regulations, state regulations, EPA, DEA, USP. Um, so having the physical facility here at JSC is actually very beneficial with the space program. We are more of a health system pharmacy practice model rather than a community pharmacy practice. And when I say community, I'm talking about like a CVS or a Rite Aid, um, those folks that are outside. 
not necessarily hospital because we don't have beds for people, but we're kind of a hybrid, so we like to say it's a health system. Uh, the, the pharmacists are considered part of the healthcare team for both the clinic and medical operations. And we provide such things like medication management for the clinical practice of pharmacy. Um, there is a pharmacy and therapeutics committee that governs the practice of pharmacy at JSC, and that's predominantly for the clinic services. Um, there is kind of a unwritten P&T for MedOps, which will probably become more formalized um, in years to come. Formulary management, uh, we are a small facility, and we have a small patient population base, so it's not like we can get anything we want, so we keep it to a minimum as to what we would treat here at JSC. Uh, of course, prescription dispensing. Um, any of the required record keeping that is uh, necessary for medications. Um, because we have treatment areas without, throughout JSC and including Sonny Carter, we do go out and inspect those areas so that we can make sure that they're safe, um, that there's no expired medications, that the things are being stored and labeled appropriately. Uh, of course, patient education, if you go into any community pharmacy practice, you're gonna be, uh, have the opportunity to be counseled by a pharmacist and we do offer that. And we comply with the Joint Commission Ambulatory Care Standards. I'm sure if you've seen hospital advertisements, they're Joint Commission certified. Um, we follow those guidelines because it is the gold standard and it just helps us to put, put something, pin, pin it on something and say this is, this is a standard that we're going for for, for medication practices. So as I mentioned before, we're not your average community pharmacy practice, although we may look like that if you stop by Building 8. Um, because we're in-house, it's considered closed loop, so for our folks, particularly for space flight, they get what they need from the pharmacy. It's also on orbit and it comes back to the pharmacy, so their care is, is continuous with us. That is very similar to being in a hospital floor moving from one floor to the next, um, except in our case it's down here to up there. In fact, up here. <laughs> uh, we have, that allows us to have a timely response to the space medicine community. Because we are dedicated over here, uh, we're not having to deal with regular people. <laughs> and because uh, we are dedicated to the JSC scope, the standard of pharmacy practice has been also carried up to the on-orbit medication kit. So it, like, again, it, like I said, again, it's a continuous thing. So I like to use the iceberg as an analog. People are, some people are very visual. Dispensing prescriptions is what most people think that when you talk about a pharmacist a practice, that's what we do. However, just like the um, tip of the iceberg is only visible, one-ninth of it is visible, there's a lot that we do that, that is pretty much unseen. And here at JSC, or within space medicine, it's even more, um, more of a need, of a de re excuse me, more of a need to recognize below the water surface because we do have a unique environment with space flight. We do have unique situations. And of course, that means that we do have a unique pharmacy practice. So this is just a graphic that I like to put up to show kind of the areas that we support. Of course, we support clinic operations here at um, JSC. The big one that I'm gonna to focus today and the one that's probably more interesting to a lot of the folks in the room is the medical operations space flight side. And then I'm gonna to touch on the research part that we've been working on with Ginger and then I'm gonna turn it over to her. Um, we do have some agency support off to the side because um, we do periodically get questions from NASA headquarters and uh, through our branch, we, we make sure that they get the right information. Uh, has anybody read Safe Passage? Okay, <laughs> of course you have. Uh, the part that I wanna highlight is the gold part, and this is part of the executive summary, and it reads, the standard of clinical care for a healthcare system for astronauts should be equivalent to the best clinical care available on Earth for those problems that occur before, during, and after a mission. For us, that's equivalent to making sure that we do we practice pharmaceutical care here at JSC. So what is pharmaceutical care? Um, it's the responsible provision of drug therapy, and I'll explain the provision of drug therapy in a minute, for the purpose of achieving definitive outcomes to improve a patient's quality of life. So that's what you would expect if you were um, terrestrially based. It makes sure that you either cure a disease, eliminate or reduce the symptoms, um, stop or slow down a disease process, or of course prevent the disease process. Um, and of course terrestrially, pharmacists play a major role in this. 
So for space medicine, if you transfer that over, what we want to make sure is that we can eliminate or reduce crew member symptomatology, stop or slow long-term effects of microgravity, or prevent them from even happening in the first place. But I would argue that the stakes are higher here within this practice because it's not just about the crew member or the patient, it's about the mission. So what is the provision of drug therapy so that we're all on the same page? It's to achieve the desired beneficial effect with minimal adverse effects. And that's important to remember throughout this talk, with minimal adverse effects. Um, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, Ginger's going to really delve into. But just to give you a quick um, introduction, PK, which is what we lovingly refer to pharmacokinetics, is how the body acts on the drug. PD, pharmacodynamics, is how the drugs act on the body to produce the desired effect. One without the other, they coincide. So when you start talking about research, you kind of need to think about both. Um, another way to look at it is that the onset, intensity, and duration of a therapeutic response elicited by a medication, which is PD, depends on the rates of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of PK. And those are the four big milestones to make sure that you have a good PK picture. We also concerned about pharmacovigilance, which is basically the science related to assessing, detection, assessing, and understanding of potential adverse effects with medications, long-term and short-term, which is perfect for our practice of medicine, right? And then pseudics, how, pharmaceutics, how drugs can be delivered to the body. It's a little bit different in microgravity sometimes, and I'll uh, go through a couple of those. So in order to do drug therapy, provision of drug therapy well, we have some responsibilities, and I'm going to quickly go over those. Um, medication accountability. Inventory management is one of our hallmark signs. And I will tell you that, um, non, that we are non-exempt from DEA regulations on orbit. So if we do need to trash something, we do have to follow the regulations that the DEA has set. They've given us a waiver to witness the destruction, mm -hmm. so nice of them. However, we still have to do all the record keeping and filing with the DEA when it is destroyed. Supply chain management is a big deal. We ship a lot of things to Russia so that it can be launched, making sure that it's cold chain appropriate, room temperature appropriate for shipping outside of JSC and, of course, within JSC is one of the things that we're responsible for making sure. And then if there is an excursion, how we can quickly address it, whether or not research supports the use of it or research supports that we need to discard it and start over. Um, pharmacy is involved heavily in appropriate selection and use of medications, both terrestrially for the clinic as well as on orbit. Of course, we do therapeutic monitoring for medications, uh, which looks at potential drug-drug interactions, drug-food, drug allergy. Um, and of course, you can't really talk about anything these days without having a financial awareness of what that looks like. So. We make sure that we are being very diligent about the cost of medications, which means we don't want to be wasting medications because it didn't ship appropriately. It's not just the cost of the drug, it's all the resources that go involved in getting it over there. <clears throat> Frontline collaboration with our healthcare providers. Um, sound alike, look alike, that's a, a phrase that you could hear in, in community practice and, and hospital pharmacy. Uh, so we want to make sure that what we're packing for our crew members who get limited amount of training in the medical kits, that, that the names and the way they are looked, the way they are packaged, don't confuse them. Drug stability, we have a unique situation. Um, we can't always refrigerate things. And because of the size of medication kits, we usually have to repackage. So does that affect stability? We don't know. Drug information for both our patients, our clinical, and our non-clinical staff. We do have international partners, which means they have the choice of flying their personal international medications, which means we'd like to know what they are and what, how, what, what's contained in them so that we can make sure that if something were to happen, our U.S. crew surgeon that might be on console is well aware. Uh, so that takes a little bit of research on our part. Medication design support, I've already mentioned. Um, any technology updates that come through pharmaceuticals, uh, Pharmaceutical-wise, new drug, drug, excuse me, new drug delivery systems, finding substitutions for obsolete systems, um, because we have an understanding of how, what the med kits look like, it's very easy for us to say, yeah, that that might work, that might not work, based on the size of the kit. Reformulations of medications can really trip some people up. Um, 
And then we've had a lot of withdrawals from the market, a lot of shortages from the market, which I'll get into, and some restrictions. So having the pharmacist as part of the team, um, that's kind of our job to make sure that the right drug um, is, is covered for what they need. Drug recalls. We actually have a big one right now that we're dealing with in the pharmacy, and it's for IV saline. <laughs> um, it affects medications everywhere, and we've actually had to quarantine medications that were on orbit before and then resupply them as, as uh, quickly as we can. Um, the, what that involves for us, because we do have a pharmacy management system, we just plug in what we need to plug in as far as the part number of a drug, and it tells us where... We, we dispense that to and what lot number we dispense. So we can very quickly make a determination as to who's got what. Um, getting it up on orbit, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but at least we can identify and, uh, and let the physicians know quickly if it's something that they need to be concerned about. Most of the recalls that we get don't impact our services. So um, we, don't, we don't bother everybody with all the recalls that we get. People would stop paying attention to us if we did. Drug shortages. Uh, Lord, this one's been eating our lunch for the past couple of years. Uh, daily vigilance is required. Um, we've had numerous drug shortages that have almost impacted our on-orbit kits. And at the 11th hour, we were able to secure some um, from another vendor, and it was able to be packed. So I'm happy to say that we've never had a medical kit on orbit that's had a drug that wasn't there because it was shorted. However, in 2012, we came pretty darn close. 86% of the medications in our onboard medical kit required an action by the pharmacist to make sure that it actually was in the med kit. Um, it got better in 2013. Uh, uh, I think it went back down to 35%, uh, but it's cyclical with the national shortages that, that come out. And that's a big one because it not just, doesn't just impact not being in the kit. But um, if we have to make a change and we use a different size or a different strength, which is like the last resort for us because it affects downhill, um, it, it can impact. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not ta talking about sound like look alike, that we don't have a potential of error in administration. So if we fly something that was five milligrams and all of a sudden we had to double it because that was the only one that was available making sure that the crew knows that that was, so it's not a good thing. We just try not to do that. <laughs> That's the last resort, Lord, that keeps me up at night. Uh, but the therapeutic differences, if there's unfamiliar, like, unfamiliarity with the crew and the crew surgeon, because they get trained on the med packs as well. Um, the time gap that occurs between the crew training and the kit contents when they're packed is a big thing that we need to consider. By the time we pack, some of our crew members are already in Russia. So that could change, um, you know, we've, they've, we've had to send notes to the training group so that they could send notes to the crew surgeon and the crew so that everybody was on the same page. Uh, changes to the paper, procedures, checklists, anything like that, um, we try to avoid. Um, and then, of course, we have to be vigilant about resource assessment, up mass, if there's going to be more trash, if there's going to be more time for the crew. And the last thing we want is a delay in treatment because that could definitely affect the mission outcome if the treatment was needed. So what are some of the considerations for medical kits? Volume, we have a finite space. It's basically a binder uh, that we can use. Mass, the amount of trash. So we try to eliminate all this extra packaging, you know, the tamper-resistant things that you guys see on eye drops. That's a foreign object debris on orbit, so we have to take that off at the time of packing so that QA knows that it's a brand new bottle. And then we shrink wrap it with the HMS team to make sure that the crew knows that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, stability is a big one, and Ginger, I'm sure, is going to go into that. Sterility, we cannot, we do not have resources on site, nor legally could we um, accept medications that were repackaged from like a vial into a syringe because of expiration date. But on, on site, we don't have the, the resources to be able to do sterile prep. So sterility is a big one. And then pharmaceutics issues. Uh, a couple years ago, we went through a med kit redesign. and Everything in the kit looked like a little syringe. And those syringes went away. The market said, we're not going to do this anymore. Um, we have some drugs that are in this, but you can't get empty ones anymore. It's kind of a um, USP requirement now. So we went about looking for alternatives 
And the most flexibility that we could get would be the vials. You, you, you can see my lovely little drawing of a vial there. Um, what happens in microgravity, because we did a C9 flight, all the fluid sticks to the glass. So if you were to go to put in a needle into the air, you're not going to get anything. So we had to come up with a way, and training was involved in the flight, to, to get the crew to be able to withdraw the contents of a, of a, of a vial. Um, this picture down here, the bottom right, the Afrin bottle, like an Afrin bottle, you know, it's got a spray mist. 1G, it sprays fine. 0G, it comes out like a stream. <laughs> so all that's going to do is just go in somebody's nose and down their throat and not be effective at all. But we were able to find another version so that it was a metered dose spray. So everything that we do now that's nasal prep is make sure that it's a nasal uh, metered dose spray. And it comes out as a mist then and does what it's supposed to do. But for the longest time, even on shuttle, they used to repackage them in these tiny little bottles, and it wasn't really going anywhere <laughs> except down their throat. Um, this is a real dirty version of a pack med packing kit, and just for your awareness, pack the process starts about eight weeks prior to pack. Depends on the vehicle that we're flying on. So right there on the bottom right, if we're flying on a Soyuz, it's about eight to nine weeks before launch. So eight plus eight is sixteen. And if it's a SpaceX or orbital flight, it's between six or seven weeks, so 15 weeks. So anywhere from 16 weeks to, I'm sorry, 14 weeks to 16 weeks is the window that we um, have backing it up from the launch date. We are fortunate in that our HMS surgeon has signed a protocol so that these are the contents of the kit. We know the contents of the kit. We know that they're going to have to change. We don't want to write a prescription each time. So we have a protocol that allows us to work with the HMS team. They identify the drugs that we need to resupply based on use or expiration date, and then it um, gets sent to us via order. So it actually saves a lot of time from trying to have to get a prescription from our surgeon. We review it and make sure if there's any drug shortages, any packaging issues, um, and shelf life is the driver for us. Cost is a factor, but if something is more expensive, but we have the expiration date that we need, and it prevents a launch earlier, a repack earlier, then yeah, we're going to go with the more expensive drug because in the long run, it's going to save more money. We have, um, I mentioned the pharmacy management system actually keeps track of everything. And the one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is we make sure that toxicology gets the contents of the inactive and active ingredients, and I'll go into that in a second. Uh, and then we actually pack with HMS and QA, and it's all based on the drawings that they have. So I mentioned that the timeline begins about four months prior to a Soyuz launch, and then the packs go into that locker right there. So really on orbit, you're looking at a resupply of every nine months based on the expiration date, because so much of the expiration date's chewed up on the ground, getting it ready. <coughs> Excuse me. I do not want you to read this. <laughs> it's just to show we do have crew-specific IMAX, which is crew-specific medications. Um, that involves more steps because it's crew-specific, so it has to be driven by the, far, the physician. Um, because it's not a set uh, list of medications each time, it does require us to review it and compare it to anything that they've had in the past, um, anything that's on the med kit that might interact with it. Uh, and then if there's shortages, we have to deal with that. If there's expiration dating, then we have to deal with that. And um, packing off to the side there, there's complete. This process starts about 19 weeks prior to Soyuz launch. Right now, we're only flying IMAX with the crew, which means it would always be on a Soyuz. I don't know if that's going to change in the future, but um, that's, that's where we are right now. It allows. Basically, this whole 19-week window allows pharmacy three weeks to do the meat of the work before packing. And then packing happens about launch minus 11 weeks to nine weeks um, here and then gets shipped over. So of course, highlighting patient safety and mission success is kind of like an underlying theme for us. And I already mentioned pharmacovigilance. But one of the other things that we are kind of charge to do is make sure that there's ad any adverse events to medications are as mitigated as, as much as possible. Looking at pharmaceutical countermeasures that might be coming through the pipeline, that might be part of research. 
if they are part of a research study, whether or not that in interacts with the medications that they've been prescribed in their IMAC. Uh, there's a clinical practice guideline within, within the clinic for circadian dyssynchrony changes, and we work with the crew surgeons for that to make sure that the folks that are part of that program are getting the right medications for their, for their sleep shifting. And then drug tolerance testing, we do it for the astronauts, flight directors and flight controllers, so basically your OSHA or your um, occupational health reasons. And it looks at potential hypersensitivities to drugs that they may not have had before and makes an awareness to the crew member of how they may feel taking that medication. Um, and then, of course, if it's a sleeping medication, that, that's really important to us. Uh, one of the things that um, I haven't addressed is the fact that the common beliefs are the pharmaceuticals that we use are the same in spaceflight as they are terrestrially. That's an assumption that we've made. And whether or not the integrity of the medications or stability of them has been unchanged within spaceflight. So those are the common beliefs. And I'm not going to go too much into this because this is ginger sin, but just so that you know, the drug is administered, it's absorbed, distributed, metabolized, eliminated. Clinical response, toxicity or efficacy. Could go either way. Or it could be sub-efficacious, and then you just have this thing rolling around your bloodstream. Um, so it's big unknown within spaceflight because we do know of the physiologic changes, and any one of these spots could be problematic. We just don't know. Changes in hydration, motility, fluid distribution, hepatic function, any one of those could throw this out of the whack. And again, Ginger's going to go more into detail. So the challenge that we have as clinicians within the pharmacy, um, because there's altered body systems that are well documented, the impacts of kinetics and dynamics are not part of the F FDA approval process for our special population. So we don't have anything to go back to terrestrially. There is paucity of data for PKPD. Um, minimal studies have been done, and the studies that have been done can't necessarily be extrapolated to all medications. You cannot compare one class of drugs to another class of drugs. As a matter of fact, you can't compare some of the drugs within the same class to each other because of the, the, the way that they work. Um, so we do know that the changes in the body that are not well researched with regards to PKPD. And stability of medications is largely an unknown. And, and um, Ginger's going to talk about that. So because of that and a couple of other things, we got involved with um, Ginger's group as an integrated team member. Uh, I think it was actually directed by Dr. Davis at one point. Um, so the point is for us to be able to communicate her doing her research thing, us doing the clinical ops thing, and making sure that we're on par with each other, we understand each other's issues, and that uh, we can help each other out in either telling the story or getting the story funded. <laughs> <laughs> um, she meant, or her bio mentioned the medication use evaluation. We've started that, which is um, the goal of that is to be able to better provide clinical care for our astronauts, better provide um, information to the HMS teams about packing and how to, what we need to pack, and of course, the bigger exploration mission question mark that um, we know is coming. We have provided support to the epidemiology group in way of drug information, um, classes of drugs, how they sometimes categorize their, their, their data, and um, supporting one of Ginger's previous studies. And we have been um, asked to be kind of a subject matter expert for clinical pharmacy ops in a various other areas, and that's just a, a couple. Um, so the more, the more integrated we get with Ginger, the more we get pulled into other stuff, which is all fantastic. It's supposed to be that way. And I think that was part of Dr. Davis's vision. And the slides are not advancing. Okay. So space medicine pharmacy practice has unique challenges. We talked about international medications that um, sometimes aren't even available in the States. Sometimes the packaging isn't even in English. <laughs> so uh, that's a big deal. PKPD unknowns. I talked about the pharmaceutics, fluid dynamics. I did not talk about the excipients concerns. Um, right now on station, we have a one gram limit on all alcohols. 
which doesn't sound like a lot. Uh, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you start talking about creams and eye drops and ointments and anything that might have a alcohol, that kind of counts towards the one gram for all of station, and that counts anything that's going on in research. So we're very aware of that, um, and so when we have to get something that we don't normally stock because that brand is no longer available, we make sure that we really look at it, and sometimes. Uh, give the materials folks a heads up that something's coming their way and kind of grease the wheels a little bit just so that they're not completely taken off guard. And we've had to work with them and the crew surgeons to make changes to medications because of an alcohol limit. Um, drug administration I mentioned, um, you know, if you can't get stuff out of a vial, the routine way, it's a problem. Uh, market availabilities, I talked about shortages, that's a big one. We have multiple disciplines for a common goal. We're working with engineering folks, we're working with physicians, we're working with nursing, training folks, and each one of them has their, their own perspective on what they bring to the table for, for healthcare. And uh, sometimes making sure that we're all speaking the same language is a little bit challenging, but we work through it. And then of course regulatory compliance. I, I mentioned that the DEA did not give us a waiver for trashing an orbit. But this also gives us some unique opportunities, it's something that you're not gonna really find elsewhere. Uh, medication use evaluation and management. Um, from a pharmacotherapeutic perspective, we want to make sure that the, the folks that are being that are using those medical kits are getting what they need to get out of them. Um, so if there's a drug in there that's not being used and the reason for it isn't really something that we should consider anymore, then why bother? Um, having it in the kit just takes up space. Shelf life improvements, um, if, there is, if there is a need for it, we don't know yet. Packaging might be a, um, an issue, and of course, stability testing support that we can offer Ginger's group. Um, continuous evaluation for performance improvement and risk mitigation. For us, that's a big one. Remember, we said that we want to make sure that the crew is safe um, and that the mission is not impacted by a medication. So um, we're always looking for ways to either streamline the process so that we can maybe, for example, shorten the window from when we get a re medication request to when it gets over to Russia for launch or whether or not there's a new clinical practice guideline for something that we need to make sure that we have a medication for on board. And then I just mentioned the research integration. Um, having the ops perspective with the research perspective I think has really been good for both of us. <laughs> so um, with that, are we taking questions now or at the end? I would say probably if it's uh, unique to your Piece, which I have a question. I think okay. you, 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 <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, you are you over because White Sands is part of JSC and they have a clinic there. Are you pharmacists for them as well? And do you, when you get your inventories, ship the stuff to them, or they do something different there? They do something different there because they have uh, pharmacists are only licensed in the state that they practice. Okay. Um, we are contractor pharmacists, so we can't oversee them. They have a, um, a consultant pharmacist that comes in and helps them do what they need to do. Now we have streamlined and helped to streamline some of their purchasing, but it doesn't get shipped to us and then shipped to them because that's, um, it cuts into our rules as far as being a distributor and we're not licensed as a, as, as a distributor. Yes? So how do you get Injected medication out of a vial in space. They, um, Melinda came up with this really cool technique called slinging. So you kind of, it's a technique, I mean, you kind of have to practice it to get like a, some sort of centripetal force so that it pulls it down. Um, it's one of the reasons why we chose not to use the point of that actual um, flight was to see if we used spikes instead of a needle. If you use a spike in it, could you get the stuff out? Well, no, because the spike can't be moved. So we learned something very valuable. In an effort to try and be patient safe and go needleless, uh, it, it actually wouldn't have worked. So, um, so by using the needle, they can kind of chase it if they had to. We try and get pre-filled syringes wherever possible because obviously that's more convenient for everybody involved. But we, um, when the medkit redesign came about, we wanted to build in flexibility because we've had so many shortages with, with pre-filled syringes. It's better to have a vial that, you know, they, they chase around the liquid with than to try and then not have the drug at all. So. 
but it was something that we wouldn't have, we didn't expect at all. <laughs> Um, okay, so it's two parts to answer that question. The first part is we cannot, um, because of the rules of uh, regulations for pharmacy practice, we can't sterilely do that. So we couldn't take something from a 10 ml vial and put it in a 5 ml vial and, and slap a label on it. Um, it. It impacts a whole bunch of other things downstream. Uh, where, wherever possible, we try to make sure that they have um, the smallest available vial. However, we found that the single dose vials, the tiny little ones, are actually harder to get out because then you're having to use multiple vials to get whatever dose that you need. So it's kind of a trade-off. Um, we try and make sure that we have the best option available, and that's where that shortage, you know, impacts comes from. Um, the med kits contents are set up right now with best case scenario. Um, and pre-filled syringes are where we'd like to be. Now, some things are only available in one size. So it is, <laughs> it is what it is. Yes? So you mentioned that there is a one gram limit of alcohol mm -hmm. on board. Why exactly is that? It's an, it's an environmental reason. I'm not exactly sure what the impact is, but um, it's an ecless rule that we found out by accident. <laughs> Materials called us, so. Yes? As far as uh, patient private information, are there any unique considerations for your pharmacy compared to the rest of No. Everything that we do, I mean, patient privacy, of course, everybody has to follow patient privacy. So there's nothing really different. Um, I mean, Ginger can speak to that a little bit more. We're not really allowed to talk about stuff that's not been published you know, um, in the general forum, it, from, from what I've been told, I mean, other folks may have different, but because we're the clinical pharmacy side of, ho of the house, I can't get up in front of a panel and say, well, anecdotally this, that, and the other, because it hasn't been published. So um, that was our direction. And do you wanna, well, when you get mic, you can answer. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll go there. Okay. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Okay. Well, that's where Ginger's latest research is coming. Um, we don't really know yet. Um, and I actually suspect that lower earth orbit isn't going to be the answer for us. I actually think that once we fly outside of that, we'll have more of an impact, just based on some of the conversations we've had. Um, shuttle, no, it was 14 days. You know, <laughs> but station, you know, the drugs that we get from the market only have about a year and 18 months, maybe two years, that come from the distributors and the wholesalers. So that's usually the rate limiting step is what we actually get in house before we can pack it. That could be probably an impact of a long margin short period. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, and I'm sure Ginger is going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I can only legally right now. I can only pack what um, what we have information for, and so that's one of the big things that's a concern for me. Is if we don't have data, and all of a sudden we're being asked, "Well, can you stretch it?" That's a little bit of a of a of a hitch for us. Um, but I'm hoping that we can get some good research to at least maybe start that conversation. And then we can always work with the FDA later if we needed to. But right now, to go to them and say, we don't have any data, can we extend shelf life? They're going to laugh at us. <laughs> How do you inventory the meds? Do they have a barcode, or do you just get the whole pack back and you look at what's missing? To for know the, what the crew really took, or do they? For the station? Um, yeah. That's um, a work in progress. Right now, there's a project um, for RFID in one of the packs, and it was actually it actually came out of one of the research gaps from a different group, um, and we got pulled in because it's ultimately going to impact how we pack. Um, it was supposed to launch on SpaceX Five, but then the equipment that was going to be able to read it wasn't launching until five months later, so it's it's got pushed off. Um, right now, it's based on what people tell the ground. 
So most of our resupply is based on expiration date. Um, we very rarely get stuff where we get a call down saying, hey, it's been used, we need to resupply it, because we have quantities and such that we should never get to that point. Um, but it has happened. For non-narcotic drugs, do you have to verify what came back and do you have to destroy them or just get clear of them? The least? So for non-DEA drugs, um, we get nothing back right now. So the, the, the program has made the decision that they're not going to return any, anything, so everything gets trashed, which is unfortunate for a research perspective. <laughs> um, we have in the past gotten things back, and we've turned it over, most of it, if not all, um, if not all of the packs, over to research for stability. It's, of course, and I'll, I don't want to steal your thunder, but it's like one time point. There's no ground control. It's an opportunity to do something with those medications. Um, ideally, it would be nice to get them back, one, for inventory, because we wouldn't be asking the crew to, to go off and do this exercise to make sure that we have account for it. And two, it allows us to be able to turn stuff over to research. Um, you know, I, I, the onesie twosies that we've been getting back um, are difficult until you can see kind of a trend. Um, and each mission is different. Each, each timeline that they have and each solar event that they're you know, um, experiencing is different. So it would be nice to be able to get them all back, but I don't, I don't make those decisions, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, I appreciate your time, guys. Thank you so much for coming out. Seriously, where did the mics go? Yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. Tina, did you make my mouse disappear? Brilliant. <laughs> there I am. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Um, all right. So, so I'm going to pick up where Tina left off, and she did a really good job of, of setting things up for, for my story. Um, when I tell people that I'm with the, the pharmacology lab or the pharmacology discipline at JSC, the first thing that people say every time is, NASA has a farm lab? What? Um, and I, I especially get this from, from young students, pharmacy or, or pharmacology students, who hear about my job and they're like, there's a job like that? How cool. Um, and, and how did you find out about it and how do I get into it? Well, I didn't know NASA had a farm lab until 2009, uh, which is when I was looking for a job and I found this job advertised in the back of science. Um, at which point I had to do a little bit of research to find out why NASA had a farm lab and, <laughs> and uh, maybe I'd want to work there. So um, I quickly had to educate myself on, on what, what goes on with pharmaceuticals and spaceflight. And if you think about going on a trip, if you go on a trip, you might take medicines. You might take the medicines that you know you take every day, routinely, or you might take medicines to prepare for some kind of thing that you expect might happen. So, and, and that's what space flight is. We're, we're going on a little trip, we pack ahead of time for things we know we're gonna want and for things we think might happen. And the first time this came up, and you know, you don't really do this when you're, when you're going out for two hours. You do this for, for longer duration trips. So the first few uh, space flight missions, there, there weren't any medications. But by the time in 1963, by the time we got up to 35-hour 30 journeys, people thought, you know, maybe we should be taking some medicines with us. And at this point, they packed uh, preloaded auto injectors uh, with a pain reliever and an emotion sickness uh, treatment. I don't know if either were used, uh, but they were, they were packed. And those were the, the first pharmaceuticals in flight. Now, things are different in microgravity, and that sounds really simplistic and stupid, but it comes down to make a huge difference in all kinds of things. Tina was telling you about filling a syringe and the challenges there. So everything that you can think of can be different in spaceflight. Like flame, 
it, it doesn't, there's no, there's no rising air current. So flame in space is different. And there's some great videos that our crew members have done with experiments on that subject. You should look them up. Um, carbonated beverages. We don't take those with us anymore because, I don't know how well you can see it here, but that's a, that's a bubble of a carbonated cola drink there. There are air pockets trapped inside it. In a glass, right, the, the, the air bubbles come up to the top, they rise. But in, micro, in microgravity, they don't. The, the gas is trapped inside. So you're actually consuming more gas, and you don't have the separation of gas and liquid in your stomach either, which I'm told makes for some uncomfortably messy burps. So no carbonated beverage in the space. So you have to apply that kind of thinking to just everything on the missions. Things can be different. And when folks started investigating what happens to the human body in spaceflight, and this has been going back since early days, uh, we've been finding out of a lot of different parts of physiology that are altered in the spaceflight environment. One of them is, is an overall upward shift of body fluids. And I know we have, a, we have a lot of doctors in the audience. Your body has a number of mechanisms to compensate for gravity by pushing fluids up. Uh, rather than having all of your fluids pool on, in your six foot tall, or in my case, five four, hydrostatic column, um, we, have, we have features, in the, especially in the lower parts of our body, that help move fluids up. All of those features are still active when you go to microgravity. So the, there's a net movement of fluid up. And this can even, we think, um, move some fluids maybe out of the circulatory system. It causes an unloading on the cardiovascular system, which changes some things in various reflexes. Um, we, can, we can get uh, changes in, in salt handling that, are, that go in with all of those reflexes. So this very quickly becomes incredibly complex because of the very complicated way that your physiology has adapted to handling uh, water and salt and, and responding to gravity and everything. It's all connected. And it's not just limited to the cardiovascular system. We know that decreased gravity disrupts the sense of balance. And some of the other HSA talks are given by the discipline leads of these other areas I'm going to mention. So you, you may get to see more about them. We have space adaptation system uh, syndrome issues where people may feel nauseous or even vomit, particularly in the first few days of flight or the first couple of days after transitioning back to Earth. This, this particular um, syndrome drives a, a, some number of medication usage by our, our crew. We have a loss of bone mineral density that seems to increase with time spent in microgravity. Uh, people experience body pains, and we think this may be due to um, expansion of vertebral discs, um, or rather lack of compression of vertebral discs. People ex complain of head congestion kinds of issues. It may be related to the fluid shifting. We're not really sure about that yet. Circadian rhythms are certainly disrupted. There's a, an absence of the normal cues that would help you set your body clock. So all of these uh, physiological issues have led to quite a number of reports of various medical complaints in space. And these are all published. Uh, on, the, on your right side is some space shuttle lists and based from the ISS, this list. Um, in, in large, well, largely these are, are things that would happen to any adult ambulatory healthy population. You know, the occasional little um, infections, irritations, um, nothing that would be considered terribly problematic. But those instances have driven um, usage of medications that Tina packs in the kit for them to take when they need it. And this is all shuttle data. Um, very shortly, everybody cross your fingers for me, I should have a new publication out doing a similar examination on ISS medication use. But, um, well, spoiler alert, it's not all that different for station. Um, <laughs> you still have to read the paper, though. Um, sleep is, is a driver of a lot of medication use, or rather insomnia is a driver of a lot of medication use. Headaches, congestion, space adaptation syndrome, um, little GI complaints, back pains, 
EVAs, sometimes, uh, people sometimes uh, complain of, of physical pain, muscle, muscle aches and strains after an EVA, largely related to the, the hard suit that they're operating in. Apparently it's really hard work to wear that suit and do stuff. So yeah, for all these reasons, NASA has a farm lab. And um, we, we have a mission that's, that's uh, related to TINAs. You know, we want to make sure that the flight surgeons have good information about how the pharmaceuticals they're using to treat their patients will work in the extreme conditions of spaceflight. Which means that, and I'm going to go all the way in. So as a pharmacologist, it's my job to know the pharmaceutical's mechanism of action. That's normal. That's, that's what I do. But it gets a little weirder here at JSC because we have to factor in um, how did the spaceflight environment change the physiology of the person you're giving the medicine to. And we have to think about whether the spaceflight environment did anything unusual to the drugs themselves. Now, this means that we do experiments. And we can't do every experiment on an astronaut in flight. It's just not feasible. We use a number of different models. And some of the talks here have been about those different models. Uh, we can use bed rest, and that has been used for some issues, particularly uh, uh, testing bone loss drugs, certain cardiac issues as well, muscle atrophy. We've just started using HERA as, as a new model. Um, they've, been, they've been testing some software for me that we're, we're uh, about to start on flight. Uh, a simple tool that runs on an iPad for an astronaut to record their own medication usage. Uh, what they took, why they took it, uh, how well they thought it worked, you know, perceived efficacy, uh, report any side effects there as well. Um, so we've been testing the software in the HERA environment. We can do a few things to model particular um, features of the spaceflight environment, and uh, one of them is to make people sick. Um, these kinds of studies have been going on for, uh, for decades. Uh, Rotating chair sorts of experiments have been used with a lot of motion sickness treatments to, to try and test efficacy and dosages and side effects and whatnot. Right now, there is a, there is a study doing something like this along with a uh, learning protocol. Um, this is Larry Young is the PI. It's an NSBRI-sponsored study. Um, his hope is to develop um, a combination of a learning protocol with a reduced dosage of a medication. So by training people, maybe we can help them use less medication, which leads to fewer side effects. We can also use culture systems to measure uh, things that go on at the cellular or biochemical level. And this happens a lot over in Building 37. We can't do everything in ground analogs because we can't perfectly model the spaceflight environment. So sometimes we have to use spaceflight. But that involves huge limitations, huge limitations. We, uh, we're using human subjects and very valuable and important human subjects who have very busy lives up there. We need to uh, use non-invasive methods whenever we can. Uh, experiments need to be non-toxic and that's every part of the experiment. Every solution you're going to use to do anything uh, has to be approved by the tox folks. Uh, we need everything to be lightweight and small. Uh, any plastic materials involved have to not degas something toxic in a closed environment. We need low power consumption. We need to arrange the protocol of the experiment to not impact the crew schedule very much. And no matter what happens, your N, your experimental N, is going to be small. On any given mission, we may have two or three individuals sign up to participate in a certain experiment. You know, your maximum number would be, what, 500 people if we had everybody ever sign up. And from, for a pharmaceutical study, that's small. That 500 is small. You know, in the clinical trials world, we run 3,000 people at a time through things. So this is a really different world as far as N goes. Nevertheless, things can happen. Um, crew members can take blood in flight, and they do. They can even do their, their own. Um, and we have, we have freezers to store the samples. We can separate out serum, um, and samples can come back. Lately, Dragon has been bringing back samples, and we're really happy to see that. 
There are also opportunities for crew members to perform measurements in flight themselves rather than returning a physiological sample to Earth for us to examine. The uh, ultrasound equipment has been used heavily in this regard and we're working on developing some new kinds of things, um, lab on a chip kinds of models where um, you can do a finger stick and have capillary action pull blood right into one of these little ports. Um, the chips can be designed with uh, preloaded reagents, usually antibody driven tests. So we can use those, uh, the binding capacity of the antibody to measure a given analyte. These kinds of things are kind of being developed right now um, and we're working on, on finding a good commercial partner to start getting some of these kinds of uh, capabilities on board. Initially we're looking at replacing, um, well, it, like aiming at a CBC kind of a test, a suite first. And then we're, we've got a long list of analytes, both clinical and research analytes that we're, we're interested in. In, in enabling in the future. And it's probably going to be something like a different kind of chip. We'll just have different preloaded chips um, that they could use. Now, um, missions now, we're, now we're just talking about having a, a one-year mission that's beginning. Um, six months has been routine for the past few years. Um, in early days, Things were really different, though. People were going on missions that lasted a few days, maybe maybe up to two weeks. And at that point, I think your thinking is different. It, it is like a camping trip. So you can, if you think you're going to need headache pills, you put them in a Ziploc bag in your pocket, and you and you take some, you take a whole lot of power bars with you and some water, and you just go and you work hard and you don't complain much about lost sleep. It's a camping trip. That's your mentality. But when you're staying there and working for six months or, or a year at a time, I think, I think we have to switch gears a little bit, and maybe even more than a little bit. Um, so we've been thinking about um, ramifications for long-term health and about um, improving behavioral health and performance for individuals while they're going through this, which, which leads us to a whole well, a long list of, of things that we need to be concerned about. And like I said, I came, I came to space research in just 2009. It wasn't that long ago. And I had the opportunity at that point to, to learn a little bit about medical operations and about how Tina's group was working and to think about everything we might need for long duration missions and to just make a list. What don't we know? What, what do we know? What don't we know? Um, and there's an awful lot we don't know. And it's not because we're stupid, it's because nobody else has ever needed to know before. These are new kinds of questions. So, so among the things that we don't know are, uh, what are the crew members using? And, and how much and why? And, and do they feel like it's working? We, we don't really know that. There's a little bit of information embedded in the medical records, but the information that's in the medical records was not collected with these questions in mind. So they didn't do, from my point of view, a very good job of collecting that information. They were concerned with taking care of the health of their patient. So that's where they were focused, as they should be. We also have open questions about the stability of medications. And somebody already said, do the medications degrade differently in space than they, than they do here? And we, we really don't know. Uh, we've taken a look at a few examples that we've been able to get returned. Um, CHS and, and Tina worked very hard to get some samples returned that I've had the opportunity to, to analyze. And that's another paper that's going to be out soon. Uh, <laughs> so um, right now, I really have, I only have a few examples and a few time points. But I don't see any, um, anything that would make me concerned about medications being stored on the ISS. Things are not degrading or showing signs of degra de degradation before their expiration dates. So right now, of the very small group of medications we've looked at, we're not seeing any signal flags. Uh, pharmacokinetics, Tina already told you what that is, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of medicines, how your body handles the drugs that are put into it. I mentioned the fluid shift uh, feature of being in microgravity. Um, I don't think you have to understand a whole lot of physiology to imagine 
that if a bunch of fluid in your body is shifted uh, from where it normally is, that this could affect how you absorb and distribute a medication. And we're, uh, we've, got some, we've got an experiment that's going to be starting in a couple years to examine this in flight. We also look at pharmacodynamics, so all the, all the medications that, um, all the reasons that a medication might be used in flight. You know, is the medication uh, finding its, its target site correctly? Is it interacting with the subsequent biochemical pathways properly? You know, is, is everything the same or is it different? We don't know. Now, as far as the usage goes, I, I gave you a heads up about this. About this. So my study is called Dose Tracker, and, and we're, uh, we're pitching to crew right now. We're going to use this uh, for a few months for each particular crew member who volunteers to be in the study, and it, it's voluntary, it's a research study. We're going to use this for a few months on the ground and collect some information on that particular individual, how often they treat headaches, how often they use sleep medications, and what kinds of side effects they usually get. Do they get a tummy ache after they take an aspirin? You know, things that are unique to that individual. Then we'll have them uh, use this dose tracker application to record their medication use in flight, and we'll be able to compare that person's medication usage in flight and on the ground. At the same time, so that's an effort to collect a more complete set of data from a research perspective uh, in a prospective fashion. We're also working with Tina's group in the pharmacy to look at what data already have been collected in the past on past missions. Um, LSAH, LSAH has been going through medical records and PMCs and, and every place they can to pull out information that is in the records from previous, message, uh, previous missions uh, and put together a big, a big awful table, a big awful table for us to comb through to, to see if we can find, uh, well, whatever patterns we can find. And we just got that data set boy, at the end of July, and, we, and we've, been, we've been trying to figure out an approach. I think we're getting there, and maybe we'll figure something out soon. But we're doing what we can to, to patch things together there. In the world of stability, there have been a few different um, efforts at a few different times, and right now we have we kind of have three different uh, tactics going on right now. Um, we've, got, we've got some analyses of flight-aged medications, and that's what I was just talking about. Um, some of these medications that we have not analyzed personally in-house, I think we're going to be able to offer to external investigators uh, who are specialists in certain areas and have them analyze things. Um, which is, which is really cool. It allows us to collaborate more with uh, chemists in the outside world. We're looking at packaging materials and packaging methods to see if we could in, increase the useful lifespan. Uh, right now, the, the gold standard in the pharmaceutical industry is to use foil foil blister packs. So it's, it's that mylar looking stuff on both sides. That is. It's really impermeable to humidity, to light, to oxygen. It's, it's really, it's awesome for all that kind of protection. Uh, we have no idea what happens in a radiation environment with it, but it's the best thing on the ground. Now, from a packaging perspective, from Tina's point of view, it's miserable. Uh, just miserable. There's all this trash. It's relatively heavy. Uh, yeah, it's terrible. It's just terrible. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure out what, what we could do that would be both protective and feasible for flight. And the answer is not obvious. We've also got an SBI out, out there. Uh, this investigator uh, from Real-Time Analyzers is in phase two of his SBIR. Um, he's building, he's building a, uh, a device that I, don't know, I fantasized a while back and convinced management to post uh, an SBIR for, and it, it seems to be working. Um, you can do a lot as far as analyzing a medication w with uh, various kinds of thermal or optical techniques. And this company is using uh, near infrared. Uh, they, can, they can shine at a sample, and the, the spectrum they get back, uh, you can identify a substance from its spectrum. 
Homeland Security is using this all the time now at, um, at ports of entry and whatnot. They can, they can open up a 55-gallon drum of white powder. Like, what is it? Is it, is it baby milk or, or is it anthrax? What is it? Um, and, and industry has come up with little handheld scanners where someone who doesn't know anything about science can just shine on the, on the white powder. And if the, if the scan, if the, the squiggle, if the trace of bumps matches, something that's in the library that's in the machine, they can identify it. So they can tell you, does it match baby milk or does it match anthrax? You know, they can do that. So, so for this project, we're, we're aiming at doing the same thing with the medications. We'll, we'll have the scanning capability and we'll build up a library of the medications we pack in good shape and the medications we pack in degraded shape. So when you do a scan, the idea is a crew member on year three of their mission, the medicines are getting kind of old. Um, is it safe to take or not? They can they can scan it and see if, if it if it matches the good spectrum or not. And you know so that would allow them a little control over what they're doing. You know how we'll implement it is it known yet? First we're trying to figure out if we can if we can actually make this work on the ground. And and they're doing that. It looks like. For those of you who go to the investigators workshop in January. Um, he'll be there with an update of their progress this year. So that's covered stability. Uh, for PK, um, we really don't know if the spaceflight environment alters pharmacokinetics. We're investigating that now. This is a new study that was, that was selected in the last NRA, and I've been working recently. Uh, there were some feasibility issues from the point of ISSMP about implementing the study the way we had proposed it. I think we've worked that out now and we're going to be moving forward. We're going to um, give crew members um, a select number of medications and have them perform uh, serial blood draws and bring the samples back down to earth and analyze them, just as you would with a standard PK study on the ground. We're going to have the same crew members perform this before their flight and after their flight, as well as during their flight, so we can compare and see if there is a spaceflight-associated change. Uh, that's really what we're looking for. The pharmacodynamic aspects of this study are, are going to be in the area of sleep. There aren't a whole lot of PD kinds of things that you can measure in a non-invasive way, but sleep is a, is a good one. We can, we can tell when someone's sleeping, we, when they're awake, there's actigraphy. There's a lot of different ways to do that. So we've intentionally chosen some medications for this study. Uh, one is, is a sedative, is a hypnotic drug that people use to help them sleep. Um, a couple others that we're using are known to have uh, soporific side effects. So we're hoping to collect a little bit of, of PD data on how well they work. I also do, uh, in, the, in the world of PD, I, I look out for some of the other disciplines that are in health and human countermeasures. We have experts in muscle and bone and, and the immune system and whatnot, and you've all been hearing lectures from all of them. Um, in many cases, uh, there are countermeasures proposed for whatever problems are in that discipline uh, that involve a pharmaceutical. So I try and, and be a good partner to all these people with uh, what medicines they are using now or proposing to use in the future. So one thing we're doing with the bone group, uh, they've already done some studies with alendronate in flight and seen uh, very good efficacy with that. Um, but as you probably know, there are lots of other bone loss treatments out there. They have not yet been tested in space. And I'm keeping my eye on what's going on with them as people on Earth are taking them. Um, bisphosphonates have a, a pretty common uh, reflux side effect, which sometimes we're, we, we've talked about being concerned about that in, in spaceflight. Um, if you don't have the influence of gravity, you might be more susceptible to reflux kinds of issues. So it, we're thinking it's possible that we might see that side effect more often. So it might be a good idea to have some, some backup plans. Um, so I've been watching denosumab and, and some of the PTH-derived drugs as well uh, come through the clinical trials testing program, uh, hit the market, and, and uh, have adverse events re reported in the FDA system. 
we've got we've got a short list that we're looking at here. This, uh, I guess, because of the market share, the huge market share for this particular kind of drug. There's a lot of activity in the drug development world with these kinds of drugs. Not every realm is that active. Uh, we also think about um, basic science results and how they could affect what what is uh, what's happening clinically. So there have been basic science results with uh, various microorganisms, potentially infectious microorganisms, um, that seem to become more virulent uh, when they're in a spaceflight environment or in a rotating tissue culture system that gets used on the ground a lot. So. Imagine a bad day. Uh, you've been infected with a salmonella or something that's spaceflight altered so that it's more virulent, and you're given an antibiotic. Well, does the antibiotic work on that microorganism that has been altered? Um, we don't know. Uh, so I've been partnering with the microbiology group at JSC, who does a lot of work in collaboration with Arizona State on, on addressing this issue. Uh, c can we do some testing of the antibiotics we carry on microbes that have been altered in this way. So that's, that's ongoing. Uh, we're also looking at medications to treat space adaptation syndrome, and I mentioned Larry Young's study already. Um, the medications that are used to prevent nausea and vomiting are generally associated with some unpleasant side effects. So if they're going to get used at all, we'd really like to reduce the dose. So this, this study um, that's aimed at reducing the dose by using a, a learning training kind of, of method, uh, we're hoping is going to work out well. We also keep our eye out for new clinical issues. Uh, the, the VIP problem hasn't been terribly well defined yet, but uh, we've had two activities in this area. One is to investigate the possible treatment options for this. Uh, the one that, that seems obvious um, is diamox that would be used on Earth for this, these kinds of symptoms. Um, it's associated, though, with an elevated risk of kidney stones, which we don't really want to give to people who are at an elevated risk of kidney stones. So there's a, there's a problem there. So I've been, I've been searching um, clinical trials for, for new drugs in this kind of area as well. We're also examining, through the medication use evaluations with the pharmacy, uh, what affected crew members have used. Um, a lot of vision changes uh, can be associated with medication use. So this, this small study that's in progress is, is trying to look at whether symptoms associated with VIP could actually be caused, at least in part, by some of the medications that people are taking. Um, if it's not, that's great. We want to rule that out so people can move on to what, what the real answer is. Muscle atrophy occurs in space flight, and we have the muscle expert right here in the audience. Um, we have been watching for them a, a, a developing class of compounds, selective antigen receptor modulators. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not. Um, we know that testosterone and other kinds of sex hormones can increase muscle mass. We know that. We've all seen in the news where it can go horribly, horribly wrong. And, and be very detrimental to individuals. Um, the pharmaceutical industries are developing more selective agents to perform particular activities in different areas of the body. Uh, the trouble with something like a sex hormone is that there's a receptor for it in nearly every tissue of the body. And uh, so using, using the parent hormone uh, can cause a lot of effects that you might not want. Um, by targeting, if you're lucky enough that, it, that there is a, a unique kind of receptor on the tissue that you're interested in, in this case it would be a muscle selective uh, receptor subtype, if we can target a drug to that particular receptor isoform, we could have our drug act only on that tissue, which is exactly what these um, studies are aiming at. And they've, there's been some really good preclinical work done They've got some beautiful studies out now where um, muscles in mice have, have been shown to, to recover from a, a disuse atrophy uh, very beautifully without having effects on the reproductive system of the animal or the brain or, or anything else. I'm thinking that 
that this may be a really good solution, but because we're still at the mouse stage of experimentation, it's, it's going to be a while before anything is in the clinic, I think. Another avenue that's, that's uh, kind of way off in the future is the idea of, of taking a medication to uh, protect individuals from potentially damaging radiation exposure. It may be that exposure to radiation is, is going to be the, the limitation as far as human beings going on spaceflight missions. If we, could, if we could remove that limitation, it would be wonderful. So can't we just take some antioxidants to stop it? I get asked this on a really regular basis. There's so much in the news now about blueberries and other fruits and vegetables and curcumin and turmeric and curry and just it, everybody has a solution, right? Just take antioxidants. Well, it turns out that, um, that the redox balance in your body is really very uh, sensitive and it is a balance. If you slam the system with a lot of antioxidants, you're pushing the balance in one direction and that direction is not always good. And in fact, there have been studies where a lot of antioxidants have been given to cancer patients. We see that people die faster doesn't happen every time with every kind of tumor, but it has been noted. So just delivering a big load of antioxidants is not the answer. Now, it could be a part of the answer, or there could be certain antioxidants, or I don't know yet. Uh, we're, we're watching some of these in, in trials now, and certainly there are no human populations in the same situation that our astronauts are in. Uh, getting a very, very low dose over a relatively long period of time from a wide variety of, of radioactive sources. Uh, the ground groups that are being tested are cancer patients who are getting radiotherapy. Um, there, there is a big drive to produce uh, a co-therapy that could be administered uh, with radiotherapy to help protect these individuals from the, the radiation they're getting and limit their side effects and, and perhaps uh, triggering of subsequent tumors that are radiation derived as well. So there's a lot of activity in the pharmaceutical world in that area. Uh, we have no idea how well it will inform what we're doing because our situation is so different. But it's something we think about. So you can feel free to contact me directly with any questions. Um, a lot of the information that I showed you about the topics that we're investigating and studies that are funded right now by NASA are on this human research uh, web page and they go into detail about particular uh, topics and here's mine at the human research roadmap. And uh, I'll entertain any questions you have now. Your, in your presentation, you had a chart showing various types of medication use on the shuttle. Mm -hmm. the spoiler for ISS. Um, I'm curious: Have you studied the relative um, frequency of the need for those medications on Earth versus space flight? So, so are they mostly the same, or some do some jump out? Yeah. So that's the discussion part of my new paper. Um, <laughs> so you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Yeah, so I, that, that, is, uh, that is kind of a natural question. If, is it any different? Um, and it's a little bit tough to make the comparisons because our population of people is, they're very healthy. They're very healthy adults. And most studies that are conducted about medication usage in the general population, they look at the general population. So they include old people and sick people and, and yeah. Uh, so making those direct connections are a little tricky. Uh, I've been able to use, I found a couple populations that may be good comparisons, or at least better than the general population. One is uh, crew on submarines. So they, they live in a closed environment for months at a time, like our crew do. They tend to be healthy. So in, in, they have rigorous schedules. They, they don't have uh, circadian cues. There, there are quite a number of of things that are like our crew members. But there are also some significant differences. They have very few women. They only started um, women on these, on these submarines very recently, at least the US did. Um, their crew tend to be significantly younger, 10 to 15 years younger on average than ours do. 
and not, not as well educated as ours. In general, though, again, another spoiler alert, uh, our crews aren't using medications really any differently than, than anyone else. Uh, they, they are using sleep medications a little more, and uh, that's, that's, really the, that's really the biggest difference. That one is really hard to tell, yeah. really hard to tell, because um, even even if you've enrolled people in a study about medication usage, um, when you ask them to write down everything they took, um, over the counter stuff for a headache, they don't always think that's important enough to write down. So you know you're you're getting a, an error in data, and you know which direction it's in. And we see this with our crew members too. Um, it might not have been noted because it didn't seem like a big deal. Also, um, since headaches are relatively common, people think of it as, oh, well, that's really common. So nobody wants to know about that because it's, it's just not important. It's almost like normal. It seems too normal. So we, we know we're missing a lot of information there, both in the general public and our population. And that gets further confounded by um, a side effect, a noted side effect of nearly every headache remedy is headache. <laughs> it's true. Go look it up. Um, it's the, <laughs> it's like, but and you know, headache is a reported side effect of nearly every medication that's produced. Um, is that, is that real? because headaches just happen to people, <laughs> um, or is it really drug derived? We're we're not really sure. We're not really sure. For things that are so very common, it's it's hard to it's hard to tell what's what's real and what's not. What else? Do you know? I assume that um, PK and PD are different in forty to fifty year old average age astronauts than they are in younger everyday people. So do you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at a new drug? And then what does space flight do on top of that older individual? I would assume that's a factor in. So the, the age of our astronauts isn't that much older of the, than the people who would be used in clinical trials. Um, as long as they're healthy and don't have any kidney or renal failure, um, they, they'd be classed as adult, normal healthy adults. Uh, probably not an issue. There are some medications where, um, in the case of a very narrow therapeutic index, we might be concerned. Uh, but the drug kit that flight medicine has chosen is, is really, really good about avoiding those kinds of medications, if at all possible. So they're, they're making smart choices about how to avoid these kinds of problems. Yes? So I understand these kits are pre-made and there's standard stuff in the kit. What do you do if you have a crew member who comes along and they say, well, on the ground, I usually take this, and you say, oh, that's not on my kit. Is that just, you don't get that, or do you, can you add new things in just that quickly, the, or how does that? That was the crew-specific IMAC that I mentioned. Okay. Yeah, so that they have So you can normal. accommodate everybody. Right, right. right. so. Within, okay. a, within a three kilogram limit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so each individual who's flying, has the opportunity to continue using their routine medications when they go on their mission. And um, I'm told they can even do things like if, if you personally have identified one sleeping, one insomnia treatment that you prefer, even though you don't take it all the time, but you know you prefer it, you can carry some of that, for instance. Or if you prefer to treat your headaches with aspirin versus ibuprofen, you could carry some aspirin. Um, you can make some personal choices about your health care in, in flight. Yeah, there's a, there's a mechanism for that. And there's also a mechanism that if we see enough of a trend of the personal packs flying the same thing that's not in our med kit, we can move it into the med kit to, to free up some space. And, and so that's all part of the work that we do with HMS and, and the crew surgeons. 
And one of the oh, things... happens more regularly. Than right. Medicine. Now that we have the medication usage... Right. Yeah, hopefully we should be able to inform those decisions a little bit better by looking at what people are really using. The, the long toll in the tent, though, is the process time that it takes to make those changes. So that's something that folks really do need to pay attention to. Because if we do need to act quickly and make some changes to the med kits because a new clinical reason needed, um, you know, it shouldn't take us a year and 15 months to get it through the system and, and packed. What else? In the back? Are there any specific medications that you know you cannot take out? Anything Why? refrigerated. Right, <laughs> right. So we, we can only carry things that require room temperature storage. Um, if storage is anything other than room temperatures, we cannot. There are some medications, especially the, the liquids and ointments and whatnot, that contain too much alcohol. Um, what else? Uh, anything that would foam. So uh, like an injectable uh, medication that might be used in a cardiac event. Um, if things it's in shaken, a, it can foam. Things in a delivery device that's not going to work in right. microgravity. That right. would be another one. Right. What else? Nothing else? Well, thank you all for attending. I appreciate your attention. Okay. surveys that we've asked you guys to take. We want you to complete them. And um, Ms. Lemons and Ms. Darren will walk around and all stand here and we will hand them to uh, those persons as you're leaving. The other thing is that on next week, we have another lecture series in case you're interested. And this is posted on the SA webpage. All of our lectures are posted there. It's going to be on kidney stones. It's next Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the same location. And that's going to be our last seminar series for this year. We're going to break for the holidays, but already we've got four more seminars scheduled for January and February. So that information will be posted to the web very soon also. So uh, thank you again for your attendance. And please turn in your surveys, please. Thank you. We appreciate your feedback.